the LA5. Feared, underestimated, overestimated at times and sometimes not really understood. But surely with unique advantages which makes it one of my favorite Soviet fighters for the Battle of Stalingrad period. And today we take a look at it. How it flies, how to operate it and all the nitty gritty technical stuff you need to know to get the best out of the LA-5. The LA-5 is a single engine, single seat fighter for the Soviet Air Force and is a collector's aircraft for the Battle of Stalingrad game. In reality, the LA-5 was basically a makeshift creation. The Soviets had the Leg 3 which was hilariously underpowered at the time. The Leg was simply too heavy for its clean of engine and was overheating non-stop. In a more or less desperate attempt to improve the situation, the Soviets fitted an M82 radial engine onto the Leg 3. The engine was originally planned to get installed onto a strategic bomber. But strategic bombing was not really needed at that stage. So the VVS needed fighters to counter the losses and to fight back against the Germans. At first the designers were surprised how easy it was to fit the M82 onto the leg, but furthermore astonished about the performance they could now expect from the newly created aircraft. The LA-5 was therefore born. While the rest of the aircraft hasn't changed a lot, the now very stubby nose is apparent and makes the aircraft relatively easy to identify. New pilots sometimes have trouble and mix up the aircraft with the German Focke-Wulf 190A, but the wings and the tail of the LA-5 are more roundish while the 190 offers pretty rectangular wings and tail. Overall the LA-5 has a more stubby appearance compared to the Luftwaffe fighters. From behind the oil radiator below the nose gives the aircraft away for sure. The Luftwaffe simply doesn't have a fighter with that small oil radiator below the nose. At low altitudes and in cruise flight the aircraft handles very well. Very responsive and easy to control. With a nice initial turn rate thanks to the leading edge slats and an effective elevator even at a little bit higher speeds. The roll rate has to be mentioned especially since it's one of the main selling points of the LA-5. The roll rate is almost as fast as the roll rate of the 190 and much faster than the 109s. That allows for quick changes of direction the 109s can't follow. It makes following and evading target more easy and allows for spectacular rollover maneuvers at the peak of a steep climb. Especially with the help of that big engine, which basically pulls the aircraft around in those maneuvers. However, in sustained turns the LA-5 is a little lackluster and doesn't turn as well as a Yak or as a 109. This is due to the fact that the LA-5 likes to beat speed very very quickly. And as soon as the speed is gone, it gets increasingly floppy and likes to drop a wing or two. Turns at very low speeds are therefore very sluggish, the roll rate and overall controllability suffers immensely. That behavior can be treated with the deployment of flaps, but that will slow you down even more and will hamper your acceleration. That can result in nasty and costly stalls above the ground. Another problem at low speed is the fact that the engine likes to overheat when not enough air is coming in to cool down the cylinder heads. That can reduce the effective performance even more at those speeds. Therefore the LA-5 can be outturned from low to medium speeds by 109s with ease. But surely the LA-5 comes to life at higher speeds, let's say at cruise speed or a little bit above. Even in dives the ailerons and elevators stay very responsive and allow for aggressive changes of direction. Those changes can be flown very energy efficient when mainly roll maneuvers are used. Since the 109s like to lock up at high speeds, this is truly an asset. However, the 190 can easily outroll and outturn the LA-5 at higher speeds, let's say 500-600 kph+. The engine however is very easy to handle in higher speeds since overheating is no problem anymore. Enough air is going to the engine and is getting rid of the excessive heat. The level speed performance of the LA-5 is another big selling point of the aircraft. But only on the deck. You basically can't fly low enough for high speed since the supercharger is extra bad in the LA-5. But below 3000 meters it's the fastest aircraft of the Soviets can field until the LA-5 FN arrives in the summer of 1943. 
The boosted LA5 reaches a top speed of 543 kph on the deck. That is faster than any BF109 and is almost on par with the Focke-Wulf 190A3, which is marginally faster on the deck, but only on very high engine settings. However, the A5 is on common power quite a bit faster. The speed and the competitive rate of climb at the deck makes it a good contender in low level operations. Above 3000 meters, however, the LA5 gets much slower. Basically, every additional meter means a serious drop in performance, hopelessly outclassed especially in rate of climb and acceleration. It's like another aircraft higher up. It's not like you can't fly there and drop on enemies, but don't expect to catch anything in a straight line. When flying high and you want to enter a dive, you have to be careful not to get too fast, since the aircraft starts to lose parts from 720 kph on, which allows German aircraft to dive away from attacks or at least forces the LA-5 to shallow out the dive. The loadout of the LA-5 is quickly explained. First off, you can equip bombs, one for each wing, 50 and 100 kg bombs which drop at once if you press the release button. I personally would never use the bombs. The Soviets have fantastic ground attackers and usually they need proper fighter support and the speed loss due to the bombs and the bomb breaks wouldn't really help with that task. Therefore I never use the bombs. The next option, the flat windscreen, was a modification in reality as well to improve visibility, since the curved windscreen distorted the view through the glass. But I personally see no real difference in-game, since we don't have that light refraction modeled in-game. So I never use the flat windscreen as well, so I just go with the curved one. The RPK-10 shows you the direct way to the closest airfield with the radio beacon installed. If there is no radio beacon on the airfield, the RPK can't show anything. The mission designer has to place those beacons. So you still have to use your brain when using the RPK, otherwise you sometimes miss an airfield because only the radio beacon got destroyed. The usage itself is pretty easy, I explained it now a few times, but I guess I do it now again, in case you haven't watched the previous videos. The RPK is obviously installed in the instrument panel of your cockpit, I will explain that in detail in a bit. But the instrument is basically just a needle and if the needle is right in the center of the instrument, then you're flying right towards a friendly airfield with a radio beacon. If the needle has some deflection to the left or right, you have to turn in the corresponding directions to align yourself with the airfield. It's really that easy. However, the instrument has no indication how far away the airfield is, so you have to actively look around for it, otherwise you will fly over the airfield, the needle will just um, change direction and you maybe wonder why the RPK is changing direction so quickly. The LA-5's armament are two 20mm Shavak cannons mounted on the engine cowling and firing through the propeller blades. And with this option here, you can change the belting of your 20mm ammo. The blue option stands for armored piercing only and the orange option here are only high explosive rounds. The mix belt is a mixed selection of both, which most likely is the same as a standard belt. I personally fly always with a mixed belt, I used all types forth and back to test them and found the mixed belt the most effective against air targets. However, the AP belts have no tracers and are option when you don't want to be seen when shooting. That of course requires that you are able to hit your enemy without tracers consistently. The HE belt is an option if you are planning to do some ground attacking, let's say clearing some AAs out of a tank column for your ground attacker friends. Then you have a little more splash damage and it's a little bit easier to hit those small targets. But other than that, I'm going with a mixed belt and I'm doing fine, I have to say. Last but not least, we have the M82F engine modification, which basically turns the LA5 into an early version of the LA5F. While all this is nice, it just means that the 5 minute limit of the boost is dropped and you can use the boost without a time limit. The performance of the aircraft isn't changed, however.
For a Soviet aircraft, the cockpit is amazingly clean and well organized, I have to say. No instrument is hidden behind the gun sight or any other object. The view to the front and to the sides is very good and much better compared to the German 109 or 190. Only the small bars left and right are sometimes a hassle, but since the LF5 rolls very nicely, you can roll around to look around those bars very easily. The view to the rear, however, doesn't live up to that standard. The seat and the tail plane are blocking the view to the low and direct 6, but the pilot is able to work around that a little bit with a lot of head movement and weaving left and right while in flight. That allows you to check your 6 properly, but compared to other fighters, it's much more work. On the left side of your instrument panel, you can see the very good fuel indicator. You will notice that it only displays a maximum of 440 liters of the 521 liters the LA5 can carry total. So you will only see the needle drop as soon as you consumed enough fuel. Note that the markings are not equally spaced out in the gauge. If the needle reaches half of the indicator, you have only 100 liters left. The red marked area highlights a reserve of 50 liters. We will cover the fuel consumption in detail in a moment, but let me mention here that you will have only about 5 minutes on the last 50 liters if you fly in combat settings. Above the fuel indicator we see the clock and next to that the speed indicator, displaying the indicated flight speed in kph divided by 10. So the 30 translates to 300 kph and so on. Right at the center of the panel you will find the altimeter. The big hand displays 100 meter steps while the small hand displays 1000 meter steps. To the right we have the compass and above that you find the RPM indicator. And here again the big hand displays the hundreds and the small hand 1000 revolutions per minute. So you need to get used to reading that gauge but I guess after a couple of minutes it's clear and then it's easy. Then we have the manifold pressure indicator and displaying in millimeters of mercury divided by 100. Meaning that if you see the needle on the 8, it means that your manifold pressure is 800 millimeter of mercury. Further to the right we have the indicator for the oil temperature in Celsius for our engine. Usually the oil is quite easy to handle, but you have to be careful that the oil is not exceeding 125 degrees Celsius, which is the end of the scale. So I can tell you now, please don't blast the gauge. This is basically all you have to do. More important and easier to overheat are the cylinder heads. We see their temperature in the gauge below. For good operations, keep the needle somewhere in between the wrecked markings. 250 degrees Celsius is a maximum temperature for the cylinder heads. If overheated, you have a couple of minutes to bring the temperature back down again. Otherwise, your engine will suffer some damage. Usually, that's quite easily done by opening the outlet shutters and raising the mixture. But later, more about the engine management. To the left, we see the climb rate indicator in meters per second and further to the left, the turn and bank indicator, where you can detect the slightest yawing and rolling movements of your aircraft, even before your eyes can pick up that movement. Very handy for energy efficient flight and for takeoff and landing. Last but not least, we have our trusty RPK, which I have explained a minute ago in the loadout section. There are no important gauges hidden somewhere. Not on the wing, not behind the seat, nothing. That's the reason I like the instrument panel of the LF5 a lot. The gauges can even be backlit, which is awesome since that makes the gauges easier to pick up. Okay, so how get this thing going? Of course, start the engine first and then as soon as it started, raise the RPM to the maximum, select a full rich mixture, open the oil and the inlet radiators fully and close your outlet radiators fully. It's possible that we have to open them later on in the flight a little bit, but I will talk about the engine management in detail in a moment. It makes sense to keep the canopy open for taxing to be able to look around the nose a bit, since the LA5 has a pretty fat nose and it's really hard to see if you have the canopy closed. Furthermore, the LA5 has no lockable tailwheel, so you need a lot of brakes and rudder to steer around on the taxiway. 
Furthermore, you don't have toe brakes, so you can't apply left and right wheel brake just like that. No dedicated levers or buttons for this basically. The LA5 has pneumatic actuated brakes, which means that if you push the general wheel brake button, that left and right wheel brake gets used at the same time by the same amount. But if you use one side of the rudder, let's say left rudder to 50%, then the braking force gets partially applied on the left wheel brake, while the right wheel brake will brake a little bit less. So if you apply full left rudder, all the braking force are goes, on, goes on the left wheel and breaks it fully down, while the right wheel will rotate freely. Breaking one wheel fully down enables you to turn very tight and for example to turn your aircraft around on the spot. To get going, throttle up to 20-30% to of the throttle and reduce the throttle as soon as you start moving. Let's say to 10%, 10-15%. Key is to take your time. I know basically I tell you this every time and it's the same for every aircraft, but the worst enemy for an aircraft on the ground is speed. So as soon as you feel uncomfortable, use your brakes and your rudder to keep you on track and to keep your speed low. Use your throttle and brakes in concert to make your way to the runway. Check for incoming aircraft from both directions and if clear, position yourself on the center of the runway and we are ready for takeoff. The takeoff itself is not very hard if you follow some basic steps. You need to know that the engine torque and prop wash will push you to the left quite hard. Therefore we need right rudder to keep you on track. You don't need flaps. I personally like to put the trim to 50-70% to tail heavy, since that setting will make your nose rise a little by itself as you get faster and you pull the stick less hard to take off. Now, throttle up to let's say 50% and push some right rudder in advance. From there on, watch your turn and bank indicator. If the needle is swinging to the right, release the right rudder a bit and let the aircraft recenter itself with a torque. Not long after you start to move, you can go full throttle. As you pick up speed, you will notice that you need less rudder over the course of the takeoff. Your tail will lift automatically at some point, wait until you reach at least 230 kph. You basically can't wait long enough, the LA5 likes its speed. Depending on your trim setting and season, the aircraft won't lift by yourself, so apply some confident back pressure on the stick, but don't do it in a rush. As soon as you feel the aircraft leaving the runway, keep the stick where it is. Retract your landing gear, keep climbing and as soon as you have picked up enough speed and altitude, release pressure on the stick. If you have your canopy still open, you can close it now. You will notice now that with more speed, the nose is really rising by itself all the time. I recommend to correct that with a lot of negative trim, so a lot of nose heavy trim. To get the aircraft back down again, I recommend to check the taxiways and the runways if they are clear and if there are no aircraft flying and rolling around. If so, start your approach in the same direction your teammates usually take off from. That avoids collisions and makes the landing and takeoff patterns much faster. Position yourself well in front of the runway and drop your speed below 300 kph. But try to hold the speed clearly above 200 kph. Drop your landing gear, lower your flaps fully and use your throttle to keep the speed around 200 kph. And point your nose at the start of the runway. You will notice that unlike in cruise, the nose gets now very heavy in low speeds. To account for that, I like to reset the trim back to neutral position or even a little bit tail heavy. Otherwise, it's very hard to get the LA5 into a 3-point attitude later on. As soon as you reach the runway, pull up slightly and level your aircraft out. You should be now a few meters above the ground. Let your airspeed drop further without gaining altitude again. Keep yourself as close to the ground as possible without actually touching it. As soon as you hit 170 kph, pull slightly up 
and try to get yourself into a three-point attitude, which means that all three wheels should touch the ground at the same moment. Try to imagine how the view looks when you're sitting on the ground to make that three-point landing. After touchdown, correct any tendencies to break out with some controlled use of the rudder and some brake pressure on the stick. By applying back pressure, you put weight on the tailwheel, which stabilizes the aircraft even more. You can let yourself roll out or you can apply brakes to slow you down a little bit faster. Roll off the runway and make space for the next aircraft. I personally think that the main reason why the LA5 gives virtual pilots headaches is the engine management. Not that it is particularly hard, but you have to work yourself into the quirks of the aircraft. Especially if you are accustomed to other aircraft like the Yak or the MiG. When I watch YouTube and I watch old videos of mine or sorties of other players, I see many LA5s used way under potential, like 10-20% under potential. In those clips the aircraft are often set up like other Soviet fighters and no other aircraft loses that much performance when run in the wrong engine settings. That could be the reason number one why the LA5 is often not so well liked. For example, an average pilot accustomed to the Yaks would maybe in the first LA5 sortie put all the radiators to let's say 50% and would set the mixture to let's say 80%. This sounds very reasonable, right? Well, but that will give you an aircraft which is not reaching its top speed and will overheat by flying in a straight line. And we are not even talking about climbing or boosting which will overheat the aircraft even more. So the pilot in that case has to reduce throttle or has to open the radiators even further which reduces speed even more. And that is not really what you want from the fastest VVS aircraft, right? So. Let's solve this and let me explain. I want to start with the radiators. Unlike many other aircraft, the LA5 has three different types of radiators. The all radiator, situated below the engine, the inlet shutters, which regulate the airflow to the engine, and the outlet flaps left and right of the cowling. The outlet shutters are the most draggy of all three. From completely open to completely closed, they cost about 40 kph. So those are the difference between a slow pig and a competitive warbird. The goal has to be to keep the outlets closed as far as you can. Keep that in mind. The inlet shutters have almost no impact on speed and are very important to keep the engine cool. And since there's basically no need to close them down, I keep them fully open at all times. The oil radiator costs about 5 kph from closed to fully open. The oil is less critical than the inlet shutters. So for standard operation I like to keep them open fully. Only when I need those 5 kph or 3 kph I like to close them down a bit. However, the most important instrument to control the LA5's temperature is the mixture. A high mixture cools the cylinder heads down. That is the case in every engine, but the LA5 in particular heats up incredibly fast or not full rich settings. So with the exception of few saving situations, I like to keep that mixture at 100%. That gives you nice and cool operations with the maximum performance. Even when flying higher up, I rather have full mixture to have that cooling effect. Then the SRPM. If you run anything lower than 100%, your acceleration at low speeds and your climb world will suffer a lot. And since there is no real repercussions for full RPM, I keep them to the maximum most of the time. Only when my engine took damage, I reduced my RPM to 2000 or something like this. But generally speaking, go full RPM and be done with it. The LA5 has furthermore a boost and it can be activated with the press of a button. Only with the boost you reach the described top speeds by adding 40 kph on the deck. In standard configuration you can run it for 5 minutes, but with the M82F engine you can run it without time limit. The boost works only in the first supercharger stage and only below 3000 meters. Above 3000 the boost is a waste of fuel. Speaking of superchargers, I found a really weird bug or let's say deviation from the manual there. 
while the LF5 manual states that the second supercharger stage has to be activated from 3500 meters on, in game you actually lose speed if you do that. In fact, in my testing I found a switch altitude of 4500 meters more effective. But since the LF5 rarely flies at that altitude, the second stage is often not needed. I don't know what that is, but yeah. Some birds are telling me that this gets fixed soon in a patch. So if this gets fixed and the switch altitude goes back to 3500 meters, I will let you know in the description. Please take a look if that is in any way corrected. But for now, use the second stage of the supercharger at 4500 meters to get more performance. The flaps of the aircraft can be gradually deployed and that very fast. Especially the 109 flaps deploy much slower. That allows for quick changes of tactics and for surprising slowdowns and feints. And while a 109 can only react very delayed to those tricks. Furthermore, the LA5 features leading edge slats which deploy automatically at certain angle of attack. I personally don't feel the effect of them that much in my flying, but they should stabilize turns at very high angle of attack. While all that is nice, they are surely less effective than the 109 slats. The elevator and the rudder can be trimmed in the LA5, which is really nice. In level 5 the elevator has to be trimmed almost completely nose heavy, otherwise the pilot has to push constantly his stick forward to keep a level attitude in cruise flight. The rudder trim is nice, like I said, but to be honest I don't use a rudder trim that often. By default the rudder is trimmed for a coordinated cruise flight. Sometimes I like to use a trim to coordinate climb for example, which happens of course at much lower speed, so you need a different trim setting there. But that means that you have to reset the trim as soon as you level out and you reach higher speeds again. And I personally forget that very often. So I uh, like to keep the trim where it is. Maybe as a reminder, coordinated flight means that the aircraft doesn't slip. The slip of an aircraft can be visually detected with a turn and bank indicator. In reality you would feel it, but in game we have to look at that instrument. The black ball of the instrument is indicating in which direction the aircraft is slipping. Applying rudder on that side centers the ball and coordinates the aircraft and makes flying more stable and more energy efficient. Speaking of efficiency, the LA5 gulps fuel like a mule the water. No joke, it's one of the most thirsty aircraft in the simulation and only now surpassed by the LA5 FN and the P39L, which like fuel even more on certain settings, which is for me kind of a wonder. On full power the boost of the LA5 cramps in over 11 liters a minute, which means that you have less than 5 minutes on reserve. If you let go of the boost the consumption drops to 9 liters a minute, that means that you chew through your entire fuel load in less than an hour even without even boosting once. For comparison the 109 consumes on combat power about 7 liters a minute. So that is really quite a bit more. The best way to reduce fuel consumption is to lower throttle and mixture. If you put your throttle and mixture to let's say 80% that still gives you a nice cruise speed but lowers your consumption by a whopping 40% compared to the unboosted LA5 on full throttle. If you have to go for extreme fuel saving, I found that a good ultra fuel saving setting is somewhere at 50% throttle and 60% mixture and full RPM. That almost doubles your range compared to unboosted power, at least on the deck. That means on the deck, on reserve, you can fly 80 km far compared to 45 at full power. Ok, but now that out of the way how sturdy is LA5 when getting shot at. If you get hit in the engine and you are leaking oil, the chances aren't so bad to get back home and actually excellent when nothing is leaking. Since the LA5 runs on a radial engine, you can't lose any coolant, which is a big plus. But the big engine can't take an endless amount of punishment. How long the engine stays alive depends on how badly the damage is, obviously. So reduce RPM to 2000, reduce manifold pressure and hope for the best. 
So while the engine is pretty sturdy, the airframe not so much. Well, depends I should say. If getting hit from behind and on the fuselage, the LA-5 can sustain quite a bit of punishment. We're talking about 3 to 5 German 20mm hits. The problems start when getting hit from an angle, from the top on the wings or from the side on the tail section for example. The wooden parts like to shatter and you will find yourself quite often without a wing and without a vertical or horizontal stabilizer. And if that happens, you are better quick with your bailout since the canopy of the LA5 doesn't open at very high speeds. There is no lever or no explosive charge to blow the canopy off, so you better be quick. But that's it for this video. Now you know the very basics of the LA5 and in part 2 we take a look how to fight. So that will be interesting for sure. Once again, I thank my patron which provided a lot of coffee for this video. I hope I see you in the next one.